And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us straight from Ember Dawn Studio, the madmen behind the upcoming Demon Ascendance RPG, the one and only Ludwig Strand Emtes. How are you doing today, man? Hi. Doing fine. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on, and thanks for braving time zone hell. <laughs> yeah. No, that was an awesome introduction. Uh, I've, I've had five years of practice on this thing. Mm. No, I can tell. So, I suppose the best place to start would be the humble beginnings, or the origin story. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Alright. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I guess it's around six, eight years ago, for me. Uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Me and some friends... Uh, or actually, some friend, some friends of mine were playing some role playing games, and I, I were, I was kind of nerdy myself, but I never dabbled in RPGs of the sort, really. And uh, uh, they wanted to play, so I said, "All right," and uh, we uh, we started playing Warhammer Fantasy an RPG. Mm -hmm. We had a GM who who uh, took us through the ropes, and uh, uh, for me. I imagine it being really hard because I didn't see myself playing like basic theater around the table at first. But when I got into it, that was my jam. Yeah. Wow. That was my thing. So I loved it so much. Uh, but we couldn't play that often, actually. Uh, he was really busy, uh, our GM. And uh, eventually he uh, couldn't do sessions anymore. And But I really wanted to play. So I said to my group... Uh, Maybe I can, maybe I can GM. And uh, at that point, I didn't know much about like I, I had never played any other tabletop RPG than Warhammer, and I didn't want to ro learn the rules because I uh, I had my own ideas. So I basically created my own system at that point, which was very rough, like uh, like, <laughs> and it's not the same as it is today. But we started playing at that point, and I started like. GMing and and created the world on the side basically mm -hmm. uh, in this world that I had in my head for for ages. I'm I'm I've been always making I've always been making games myself, and uh, I have a degree in game design and I've worked with digital games for quite a while now. So I'm I'm, I'm that wasn't really an issue. And then we uh, then it all evolved from there. Basically, we uh, we started playing, and then we've been playing for five, six years now, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been in the world of Demon Ascendance all along. And uh, last year, I decided, huh, maybe I can make this reality and actually do something of this. And uh, I uh, started working on it for real as a product. Uh, um, mm -hmm. so, so, so that's basically how I started with RPGs, and then. I very quickly started making my own with it without even ever really trying any other system. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing at first, but uh, now I've been playing a lot like different games and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's a uh, uh, big open doors now. For what it's worth, um, there's a, there's a line from graphic designer Polish um, Polish Sure that always comes to mind with this sort of thing. The greatest innovations in the history of mankind were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's true. Like, uh, uh, I guess it was just both good and bad, since we, ha like, I at least think, like, the system have, like, everyone borrows, right? But yes. in the beginning, I didn't really borrow, because I didn't know anything. So some of the mechanics are, you know, taken not from RPGs, like, they're taken from other games and things like that, like ideas and things, and then they uh, intertwine with the other things in the end, I guess, but you know, I didn't start off like, oh, I'm going to make a system and I only played D&D, &D. so everything is going to be really D&D &D based 
in the sense of like how you do things uh, as an example. And and then you you build from there. Instead, I took the other way around and I <laughs> I started with nothing and just had some rules from Warhammer, but that was it basically. And then we I adapted some, not adapted some D&D rules, but I wanted a system that was uh, easily like a player who's played D&D should easily be able to understand both dice mechanics and uh, attributes, basically how, how you deal with them. Even though the system and mechanics are quite different, you should feel very familiar when you start up, basically. So that was the idea. So I more twisted it to have a um, uh, D&D uh, <laughs> feel when you start out, at least, with how dice mechanics and... Uh, uh, it's a it's a ability scores in yeah. D and D. Sorry. Yeah. So. Yeah. I. It is can it is it is kind of amuse is kind of amusing that you that you mentioned that especially since um the stat line in something in something like Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is going to be a different affair than anything in a um D twenty based approach, but. Yeah. As far as do as far as doing this kind of thing without really having a clue, you are in good company. There's pl <laughs> there's plenty of games that I've covered here and and have and have run that started that started out as somebody just hacking a system until they did until it um didn't resemble what it was initially supposed to be. Like, mm. You know, like how nobody plays Uno as written. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Everyone, the house rules is the name of the game, basically. And I, I, eventually, there's somebody's gonna say, "I play Uno as written," and I'll just go, "You're a, one, you're a liar. Two, if that was really the case, why, why would, why is there a special version of Uno that contains a bunch of submitted house rules?" I remember having that <laughs> when I was in high school. Uh, yeah. But going going on from that, you you said that you wanted to do. You said that you wanted to do Warham Warhammer, but but your own I but you had your own ideas. So that brings me to um, the concept of Appendix N. And I did try and try and brief what that it what that is in um in current parlance. Yeah. Um, basically, it basically it's a shorthand for the for inspirational material lists. Um, which you see, which you see quite a bit. It's just that it's referred to as Appendix N because that's where that material was in old school D and D. So the name's just kind of been a shorthand for that. Um, hmm. What sort? What sort of media? Whether it be, whether it be other role playing games, vi um, video games, books, film, etc., are in your particular Appendix N for Demon Ascendant. Yeah, like with inspirational things, basically. That's yeah. what I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So, uh, so first off, like, uh, I guess I like, should explain a bit about the game first to actually get where things are coming from. So mm -hmm. in, in in Demon Ascendance, you uh, play in a fan... It's a fantasy tabletop RPG where you play as a, 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 a demon born, basically. And what this means is... This is not this is not a classical fantasy where there are elves and orcs or dwarfs or uh, halflings and uh, other races. Basically, this is a world where uh, demonic realms influence uh, the mortal realm, and you are a human with a demonic uh, uh, heritage. Not heritage is not the word. Ancestry. I'm not the word I'm looking for. Ancestry. So our ancestors is the pronunciation, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so you have a demonic bloodline. And, and demonic ancestry and uh, uh, this depends from what demonic realm it comes from so you have some additional powers in addition to your class basically and so you could be from the infernal bloodline or from the dreadful bloodline so you have either powers of infernal which is more fire and molten or uh, dreadful and you have shadows and terror and darkness and there are multiple bloodlines to choose from here and then this influence your class you can pick this with any of your class and um, that is basically the the setting, I guess. So my initial uh, appendix, then I guess, is uh, I wanted to create a a fantasy 
world where you fight basically with with weapons like you do in uh, Lord of the Rings or D and D and all of those epic fantasies. Uh, but I didn't want all the the races in there, and I wanted uh, spell casting to feel different. I wanted uh, um, more powers similar to what they do in Avatar Last Airbender, or like Dragon Ball Z, or basically any anime, I guess, where you have key or power. It's 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 not always just magic. In D and D, it's magic. Everyone casts spells, basically, even though they're doing almost physical abilities, it's, it's close to spell casting, and they call it spells. Not not everything, but a lot of it is spells. So here it's more like it's innate power. You have it inside of you, and you you use it to manipulate your fighting style, even though you're a fighter. So as if you would think of Avatar Last Airbender, you would never, like, at least in my head, they don't cast spells. They bend elements, right? So it's mm-hmm. similar here. You bend the power of your bloodline. Uh, we don't call it bending, uh, but uh, that's the idea. So if you're a fighter-style character like a berserker, you would still have, if you're of the dreadful bloodline, you would be able to use shadows to manipulate things around you, but you can't use them in a way a spellcaster would be like, oh, I do all these tricks, and I do shadows on the wall, and I do fancy things. Well, the... Uh, the Berserker would have spells that benefits his weapon attacks and weapon abilities in more of a way at like, okay, I can extend my weapons with shadows and have a bit an extra additional reach. I can use shadows to attack anyone who comes near me or pull them towards me and do things that are uh, fighting focused abilities Mm-hmm. but with magic-like effects without it being spells. It's more or less like magical abilities you have. It is, and, yeah, it, it is interesting that you, make, that you make that distinction because um, a lot, because a lot of, there's, there's a bit of a habit that, that a lot of designers have of making, of making um, spell like, of making spell like abilities. But when we look, when we look at a lot of the, supernatural features that we see in myth in mythology and stories and the like the way the way that met the way that um people approach magic in games doesn't really fit like just look no. just look at just since you brought up since you brought up lord of the rings let's br- let's bring up the magic used in that <laughs> yeah yeah um, the idea, the idea of of only being able to cast a certain num- a certain number of times, or having th- or having this, fi- or having this finite resource, not really a thing. Mm. Not really a thi- not really a Sorry. thing when you see, when you see Gan- when you see Gandalf using ma- using invocations or use or seeing Aragorn li- doing the equivalent of lay on hands. It's just something that they're able to do. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Oh. That is very like that's uh, yeah that's very cool yeah like and I also wanted like the sorry maybe you had more to say there no it was it was I also there I think it's also telling that you brought in uh, that you used Avatar as as a point of reference in this because well I've seen I've seen a fair few people that tr- that sort of bending is analogous to key in a lot of a lot of a-, a lot of Asian work, and I've seen a lot of people try and equate it with magic. Or you have, say, the D and D monk that tries to have it as a magic like ab- ability. Yeah. But that's yeah. not really how it works. It is not magic. No, exactly. No, no, no. Very true. Like, uh, uh, and I also want, well, like, with this thing, like, I, I obviously have like, <laughs> it's avatar like but with other powers and like with the demonic touch of everything. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to make sure, you know, when you have these powers, when you give like in TNT, it's sometimes, I I, I wouldn't say just TNT, a lot of of, uh, epic fantasy, you provide spells to characters you shouldn't really have spells. Like maybe the rogue, like I don't, if I think of a rogue, I don't think them as a spellcaster, but in D&D they are, and the ranger as well. They are spellcasters, 100%, like on, on the site, like they have this, has this thing. But I wanted to make sure that the, the magical power you have inside like makes sense in the world, so you have this demonic bloodline 
inside that allows you to, to manipulate certain aspects of your uh, of your power, basically. Uh, instead of being a just magic magic. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but I try to really... Uh, it should... It should make sense within the world that I, as a berserker or as a ranger, have these powers. Like, because I'm not a spellcaster. It's not spells I'm using. It's like, okay, but this is my heritage, basically, or my ancestry. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I can see you. I can see in hindsight, I can see the avatar influence because of how many of the bloodlines that you showed are rooted in um, elements. But yeah, and I'm I am I am counting the dreadful in this because shadow is it, it, shadows are an element. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, no, I would say I'm stretching a bit of like demonic in uh, um, in in this world is not uh, necessarily dem de demonic has a lot of meanings in, in re reality. Like a, a demon is basically anyone with. Uh, a power, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, in DD, for instance, demons is more referred to the infernal kind, or like the dread, like the, the the maybe the ones with like shadows and darkness could also be called demons, like evil powers. Mm -hmm. And it, it's kind of like this here as well, because you have this demonic uh, thing. But demon is a bit uh, is a little bit more stretched here, where you have example as the magnetic. It's not really, it's not really demonic. The first thing you would think about it, but it, it makes sense within the world. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so I guess um, it, I'm stretching a bit of the element, and I try to combine them a little bit to not make them as avatar. I guess there's not the there's no wind, uh, wind demonic bloodland. There is a storm one who's dealing with both lightning and and wrath and. Mm -hmm. uh, and and wind instead, and then there's there are more of them. I guess they have yeah. like in Avatar they have four four basic elements, and then they have like uh, they, yeah they do some other things on the side like metal bending and things. But mm -hmm. um, except for that, that's basically it. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to the when it comes to the character building, and there are a few things that I, f I found interesting and was. A bit curious as to how as to how these things came to be. The first oh. is the e is the edge dice. Yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of people talking about edge dice actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, do you want me to explain it or, or should I? Um, uh, Let um... I think we explain first and then go into how the, how this particular mechanic came to be. Yeah. All right. So I. I wanted to make sh uh, try to okay. I'm going to explain the me mechanic first. So edge die is basically it replaces uh, situational bonuses, or edge die is the situation situational bonus. So instead of having uh, gaining plus one or plus two or plus five for doing specific things or advantage, as in D and D in most cases, you gain edge, and uh, this edge. Uh, it's stackable, so you can gain two edge and three edge, uh, or three up to up to three edge, basically. Mm -hmm. So edge starts as a d4 die, which you add when you roll for attack. You roll it uh, besides your d20. So you, it, similar to a bardic inspiration, I guess, it, at, at the first stage in D and D. So you roll a d4, uh, and but this can gap, be upgraded. So if you have a two situational bonuses, like, okay, I'm flanking this guy, so I get edge, and I'm on this hill, and he's below me, so I get two edge. So at this point, my d4 die is upgraded to d6, and then upgraded to d8, if I have three situational uh, advantages. And uh, it's very simple to keep track of your bonuses, because you just know what provides edge. You don't have to remember any numbers, and it's an up a stackable thing. Uh, so instead of remembering, oh, yeah, this ability provides me with plus two accuracy or hit rate or whatever, and this other thing provides me plus five, and then you start counting. Instead, you just like, oh, this provides me edge, and this provides me edge, and then you roll the die, basically. So it's really simple to remember. 
my idea was that I didn't want these. Uh, I didn't want this. Uh, first off, I didn't want the advantage, uh, which is very simplistic that you do in D and D, but it also uh, takes away a lot of. Uh, hmm. I would say like a lot of tactical options or tactical things that could have happened because you already have advantage. So you don't need to be more tactical or, uh, and also it, uh, influenced, uh, uh, crit, um, crit rate a lot. If, when you have advantage, you basically double your chance to crit, right? So it's a lot of crit builds going on. I didn't want that in my game and wanted more of a tactical approach. And I didn't want the plus one, plus two, plus five uh, bonuses because I know people say that, oh, but the game only has plus two, so it's easy to count. Everything is plus two, so it's no matter. But uh, I'm a designer myself, and I know it's tickling in my fingers when I can actually give different bonuses in different situations, um, and that's going to happen. So I decided to skip that whole part as well and just mm -hmm. do the edge die instead mm -hmm. uh, to make it as simple as possible. A lot of time it also makes sense because you, we say a lot of time my players just ask me like, wait, do I get edge for this? Because you don't really know, but it makes sense in their head that they gain edge. It's not like, oh, this special attack has a plus one bonus. It would make sense because the opponent is out of position or uh, you're on top of him or blah, blah, blah. But in most cases, the answer is yes. So it's very easy to track and it's uh, uh, easy for the players to remember uh, their thing and just just then just roll the additional die. Mm -hmm. And with the the other thing that I do that I do find a bit interesting is um the is the relationship that you have with defenses since <laughs> instead instead of doing just a universalized um arm, armor class and and the saving throws you have. You have what appears to what appears to be a a set of defenses, each of them rooted in at least one of the um, pri one of the primary attributes. Yeah, yeah, uh, correct. So basically, uh, on the AC part, I don't do armor class. Mm -hmm. uh, Demon Ascendants does a thing where you, when you're attacked, you choose a guard. Basically, I'm going to take this person then and go on the defenses. You choose a guard, basically, and this guard. Uh, it's it's your sh it it makes the combat more uh, fluent. Like you actually have something to like you can decide yourself how you try to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you either parry attempt to parry the attack if you have the means to parry, like if you have the actual weapon to be able to parry, or whatever that might be, or you try to evade or you try to brace for impact. So parry is basically you roll the die with your weapon and then you try to exceed their attack and. Uh, Evasion is you have an evasion value, so you have like oh I have a fifteen evasion. That's it's similar to AC, but I don't have to use it, and it's only going to be on like fast and agile characters that have high evasion. So you can choose to like oh I'm going to hope that my uh, static number just is enough for the attack to miss because you don't know the attack yet. The GM will ask for your guard before you know the number or the value you're fighting against. Mm -hmm. Or you just brace, and when you brace, you take the hit. So you're going to take damage, but you're going to spend some of your power. You have a demonic power that you can spend mm -hmm. uh, as, as an additional resource. So when you spend this power, you can reduce uh, the damage a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. embrace is, I guess, the least optimal option, but sometimes when you, you can't parry and you know you're going to be hit anyway, it's the only option you have if you want to reduce the damage. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's basically it, and, uh, and then you have these uh, uh, attributes and the defenses, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So uh, defenses are not directly connected, uh, as you said. They are in between uh, everything. So discipline, for instance, there is willpower, discipline, fortitude, courage, resilience, and reflexes. And I could say the uh, uh, ability scores, or in, in this game, the attributes are... Uh, similar to D&D, &D, but not exactly the same. There are seven of them. So there are agility, intelligence, endurance, strength, charisma, wisdom, and dexterity. Mm -hmm. So all of these are connected to... Uh, or all, all defenses is connected to two of these attributes, and they take half of the value each. 
-hmm. And I did this because I, I, um, like, I, first off, I wanted to do my own thing. And then I wanted to be able to uh, manipulate how you deal with defenses. So mm -hmm. in instance here, if I don't know if you, you've seen the bar, but if you've seen the bar, you would uh, know that agility is not connected to defense. Mm -hmm. And that is because agility is connected to your evasion. So agility is already really strong because it's uh, influenced your movement. While wisdom is the only defense, uh, only attribute that connects to three defenses. So in this case, having a high wisdom score is really good because you're good with your defenses, but agility is nice because you have high movement speed and high evasion. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want direct connection because I think it uh, takes away a lot of the things. It's, For instance, it's always a problematic area where like, we say fear and actually like being intimidated and actually intimidating someone. Uh, could be an issue if you don't do special things on the side and give people additional talents because uh, being intimi uh, like intimidating is usually in, here it's uh, a strength thing but it could be charisma based as well I think it is in D&D &D. and mm -hmm. then you're supposed to be bri brave as well right so it, it's it, it doesn't always make sense if you're this big we say you're this big dude that's super good at intimidating people, but then you don't have a high... Uh, uh, I guess fear is intimidation, like intimidation save in D&D. Uh, &D. So I think charisma is this intimida for intimidation and fear. So in this case, if I would have it like this, it would be that you're a really big, strong dude and you intimidate someone, but when someone intimidates you, you don't have the courage to withstand that intimidation yourself because your charisma score is low, for instance, if you don't have any additional aspect on the side. So I try to make sure that all of these are connected to two of them. So for instance, courage is connected to both strength and charisma, which means if I'm very charismatic and I'm strong, I'm, I have a high courage. Uh, so I don't require to have a lot of charisma to be courageous, I could just have a lot of strength to actually be quite good at it. Not optimal, but quite good. Instead of being locked in that I'm going to suck at these type of defenses or these, type, these types of saves because I don't have the specific attribute. So I don't need a lot of intelligence to have discipline. I can have quite a bit of endurance and actually have some anyway, basically. So that was the idea. Instead of having... Uh, it being locked, if discipline were locked to intelligence, uh, no other character that doesn't have a high intelligence score would be good at discipline. I didn't want like that. I wanted to make sure you could actually influence this a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, but not not optimally, I guess. So that was the idea. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to some of the derived stats. Um, I, there's a there's a few things that I saw that that definitely interested me. One of them is the it's funny you mentioned bardic inspiration earlier because charisma provides its own, provides its own equivalent with the with the inspire points. Yeah, I like that, it, yeah. Sorry, I like that. That's a bake that that's a baked in thing. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. The. Um... So basically, all the attributes influence your your basic attributes influence everything else. Mm -hmm. So agility, as I mentioned earlier, provides you with evasiveness and speed, and and uh, and uh, endurance provides you with health, and uh, and your brace value goes up. So you can actually brace for like on the guard maneuver brace, you brace mm -hmm. for high impact. Mm -hmm. Strength increases your weight limit. Intelligence increases your demonic power. Wisdom is the strongest one with defenses. And here we have Charisma. Mm -hmm. So Charisma has this thing. It provides you with with every second point you have in Charisma, you gain an Inspire uh, point. And Inspire is super easy since we only explained Edge. So Inspire allows you to give Edge to someone at any combat situation, like on an, an attack or a, uh, or a defense or guard, but also in... Uh, uh, situations where you're a uh, social situations where they perform another charisma check 
Uh, so you can't use it. It's not exactly as bardic, I don't, bardic inspiration or guidance, maybe I'm thinking of, or you can't use it like that. You can't use it on anything, but you mm. can use it in combat situations and on social interactions. Yeah. You can use your inspire to give another creature uh, edge, basically. Mm -hmm. so that's the idea. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, the the other th the other thing that I that I couldn't help but notice is the fact that when it comes to demonic abilities, there's two resources, and that is power and cores. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Uh, so power is uh, similar to I guess mana, spell points, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite low, uh, and it's it's uh, it's the resource you use whether you are a sorcerer, um, a berserker, a ranger, or whatever. As long as you're uh, uh, one of the have one of the bloodlines, mm -hmm. in this game, uh, all play characters do. So uh, you start with very few power, uh, so it's not a, a big resource that you manage. It's not like in up in the forties or fifties. Or anything like that. It's you start as a berserk, for instance. You start with eight, and most of your demonic abilities uh, cost you one or two power. So this limits how much of your uh, demonic side you can actually use. Uh, and then you have the cores, which are actually like um, I don't know if I mentioned it in the. Um, I didn't want to confuse people in the. In the preview guide, but cores are actually called power cores initially, mm -hmm. and it's 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 a stronger version of it, it is a, it is uh, it's a stronger version. It's also your demonic power. So these are for making sure that some abilities that you have, which are more powerful, can only be used much more rarely. But you're not super limited. Like you have as a uh, berserk, for instance, you have two cores when you start mm -hmm. out. And uh, I guess you have like five when you're at highest level or something. And as a sorcerer, you start with three cores, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, and these cores are uh, limiting you a little bit because I didn't want to put super high power costs on some abilities. Instead, I wanted some of them to be like, oh, they have this course. It's, it's a way of... Uh, simplifying spell slots from D&D, I would say. You don't have multiple spell slots in different levels. You have power cores, and some abilities require them, and you, you only get them back on when you sleep, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the idea of power cores. I can say, for instance, like, uh, so the magnetic bloodline, for instance, can walk upside down on walls and ceiling, and to do this, they must do a a thing called polarity switch. They switch their gravitational point, basically. Mm -hmm. This is a very powerful powerful ability to actually walk on the wall, so it costs them a power core, or a core. Uh, yep. So they can only do this twice mm -hmm. uh, before taking a longer rest. Um, yeah. While a lot of other abilities only require power. Uh, is when you're at how, how we how When it comes to recovering power, is it a case of you recover it you recover it when it when you rest, or is it is it more of a short is it more of a short rest kind of recovery? I.e., yeah, uh, both health and uh, and power can be recovered during short rests as mm -hmm. well. Uh, so these are more you cannot recover them fully. I have I don't use uh, uh, any um, uh, recovery die or anything like in D and D. Instead, you, or hit die, I think it's called in D and D. Uh, instead, you just you get back. When, on, when you rest, you get back half of the health you lost and half of the power you spent. But of course, only restores on longer rests. Mm -hmm. And I'm perf I'm perfectly fine with that because with with every, whenever you have a limited resource, there is the temptation to be very conservative with it. Um, I've yeah. nicknamed this kind of thing the um, ra the rainy day paradox. You know, you're sa saving for saving that. The joke, the joke has always been, I can't use one of my 99 mega elixirs. What if I need? What if I need it later? He says, yeah, "Well, yeah. he says, well, in the final boss of the campaign." Yeah, no, no, no. That's exactly what I said. Like the, it's the Witcher drama, right? You always have too many potions. You never spend them because when you're gonna need them later, probably. Yeah, you you don't. 
you're ne you never know when you're going to need it later, and then it's the end of the <laughs> and then it's the end of the game. Yeah, yeah. That's oh, true. now the because and because of that, the the vibe that I get out the vibe that I get out of this, oddly enough, is the is somewhat reminiscent of the encounter and daily ap approach that was in um, fourth edition of all things, because of the relationship between power and um, core. But speaking of abilities, when I looked through the previews of the bloodlines, I note I noticed that the there that there was that there was a separation of abilities between between three angles agile strong and gifted yeah and i am curious what that what that in, what that entails in terms of how you advance is it a case where you where those are categories of points you're getting or how does it work yeah exactly so basically it's it's like this and i touched on this a little bit earlier as well so if we take the infernal for instance the infernal is fire so you would assume like okay so i can cast a fireball right mm -hmm. uh, but all characters can't because uh, fireball is a typical spell and as we talked about al already i tried to do this like with fighter size they have this innate power all this the, their power and abilities comes like from their weapons and they do it like around them they light their weapons on fire or they uh, uh, when you attack them they splash molten blazing heat back and things like that mm -hmm. uh, so all characters are uh, separated into three groups uh, so we say if you take the class if you take the classes so you have uh, for example you have the rogue the ranger and the monk they are uh, treated as agile characters so when it comes to their bloodline, they can only select abilities that are agile bloodline abilities. So a rogue could never select the fireball ability because that's only for the casters, which is, are the gifted uh, category here or characteristic. Mm -hmm. uh, so this makes sure that they remain a rogue or uh, like an uh, like a fighter type character and doesn't become a spellcaster just because of their bloodline. So. In this case, uh, we take for the uh, as as an uh, example, we take the, the the spectral and the ranger. So as a uh, as a as a ranger, they could have uh, their agile spectral abilities are that they can shoot through multiple creatures basically by making their arrows like spectral arrows, and they can do a ability called phantom rush where they. Uh, uh, twist, twist uh, in and out of realms and actually run through their enemies mm -hmm. or turn their uh, weapons into spirit weapons and uh, strike them for psychic damage. Uh, but they cannot do fancy stuff as a sorcerer would where they do like telepathic stuff and uh, you know confusion and things that is more s spectacles and uh, uh, seem like uh, spellcasting. And here you also have the berserker. So if you take the bers like a berserker and you go for the magnetic bloodline, you would be able to like slam the ground around you, and everyone would shake, and you can pull enemies towards you, and uh, and and things like this, which uh, builds on the berserker uh, feeling. So for uh, berserker is one of the strong characteristics; it can only choose those uh, uh, demonic abilities, basically. Mm -hmm. So the Berserker, the Guardian, and the Warrior can take certain amount of demonic abilities, and the Sorcerer, Druid, and uh, Warlock can take uh, uh, like the gifted abilities of their bloodline. Yeah. And in the preview here, I only go through like the, the first things, uh, like from level 1 to level 3, the, the mm -hmm. game actually progress up to level 15. So there's a lot of more abilities and things coming, but uh, uh, I couldn't. And I wanted to keep it brief, <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> and I did notice that there are um, that within within the classes presented, there are specializations. And I'm guessing this. I'm guessing the. I'm guessing the features that you get with specializations are going to be akin, going to be akin to the. F the features that you get from class, i.e., you're going to be getting them automatically at certain levels. 
Yeah, exactly. So uh, the class themselves are like how you get things. This is one once again the things that I'm trying to take like or make it easy for anyone who comes from a D and D. Like it's you basically you gain abilities as you level up. Uh, uh, so that and then you choose. Uh, not it's not a subclass here. It's a specialization, but it's basically the same thing. So you pick the ranger, for instance, and then you choose the specialization, and you go for like, oh, I'm gonna go for the monster slayer. So then I gain uh, another ability. Yeah. And uh, I do things uh, here in special order. So you basically, your ranger always gets uh, new, or your the ranger base always gets new features at level one, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, and uh, their specialization gets new features at. 2, 5, 8, 11, and you gain a new demonic abilities on level 1, 4, 7, 10, 13. So it's like mm-hmm. all the levels are important levels, but for different aspects, basically. Yeah, so there's the other there's thing never I, a boring level. Yeah, basically. I've I've railed on games that have de- that have the dead level problem in the past. Yeah. Um, the other thing I noticed is instead in, is that the cla- is that the classes themselves have mm-hmm. have their have their own sp- have their own specific um, stat line, one that is somewhat reminiscent of the stat line I, that you'd see in Warhammer. Um, I'm guessing I'm guessing that served as an influence because of how you have just that line of the base um, stat setup. Ah, uh-huh, you mean like how it's displayed, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, yeah. That is actually not from when we played Warhammer, because in my, the version I played in Warhammer was earlier before they had that stat line. But then I, when I decide, tried to, I wanted to design a clean look, mm-hmm. and uh, I, so I went through a lot of systems, and I really liked how Warhammer displayed, like the later versions of Warhammer, like the, I think the fourth version or something, I don't remember, uh, displayed their. Abilities, so mm-hmm. that's what I and they, they do this in D and D as well, I guess. Not not maybe exactly like this, but they only display their their attributes. While I explain like health and power and course speed and evasion as well within the same row. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, they do similar things in D and D, but yeah. So it's I guess it's inspired from uh, Warhammer how it's displayed. That's very true. Yeah, uh, but it's it it at least in my opinion it looks very neat and it's easy to like. Read, and I, th- the reason I find this I find this interesting is a lot of games would have, would have you either randomly roll the st- the stat lines or um. Or ha- or, ha- or have it or have it point based, whereas you have it that it's um, that the stat line is is set, and the cho- the choices outside of the class are going to pl- are going to play as much of a factor. No, uh, true. So basically, you have these the stat line that's here mm-hmm. is uh, your stat line or your class. Uh, but also, if you read through, if you read through the character creation, you would also see that at step number two, you have this thing where you place a few attributes. So it's not a point by point based like this, mm-hmm. but you have a few things to place. So uh, I don't in Demon um, it only uses uh, full numbers, right? So your modifier is your value. If you have four strength and doing a strength check, you're using the value of four. Mm-hmm. So here, you, in addition to this starting uh, attributes, you actually uh, can place a plus two, a plus one, a plus one, zero, zero, and minus one, and a minus two as well, or you must place them. So you will have minus... If you're not, if not nullifying yourself and going like <laughs> all flat, you will be bad in some things. You will have a minus four when you roll the die in something probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you do, you do actually place a few points yourself after looking at your uh, like your ranger has a base, and then you place a few additional points. Mm-hmm. So for the ranger, it would be optimal to probably put your num your your two into dexterity. Yeah, and you but... cannot put multiple points into the same attribute here. So mm-hmm. you need to put where you put the two. You cannot put any other point. But no matter so where you, know. you put, no matter where you put, no matter where how you um spread it, there's going to be one attribute that you're just not going to be as good at as others. Yeah, like if you don't, you can flatten yourself out 
pretty much, but that I would not recommend that because that means you're not going to be like you are made to be good at some specific things. Your whole class is based on that, so you wouldn't want to be all flat. Basically, mm-hmm. you would. It's like I can probably forego endurance as a ranger, for instance. Like I don't need health. I don't want to get hit anyway. Like if I'm hit, is that health going to help me really? So I can probably, and I can go high on my hit rate and on my agility and actually dodge things instead. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so you're always going to have something up and down. Yeah, and I did note, I did notice that you have you have a degree of unification when it comes to learning abilities because because if I'm read if I'm reading this right, um, the ability points that you get you can spend on either your. De- the, your demonic abilities or your class abilities. Yeah. No, correct. That is very true. So either, like, uh, at start you gain two ability points, level one, and, uh, um, for instance, if you t- if it, we continue with the ranger, you have an option of uh, uh, five physical attacks at this point, like aimed shot, uh, you can do dual strike, like rapid fire, swift attack, mm-hmm. or you could go into your bloodline and actually pick from there, where you have uh, a selection of three. Uh, so if you go on the dreadful, if you're a dreadful sorcerer, you could also pick in between like the echo strike, the shadow step, or the terror blade. And then you build your character from there. And then at level two, you get another ability point. Level three, you get a, a, a third ability point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it continues from there. So it's uh, you can even even either dwell deep into your uh, bloodline or continue as your uh, um, class a lot if you want to, but as your bloodline abilities usually costs power, uh, which are sparse and you don't have too many, you it's always good to have these you know physical attacks with you as well, except for the standard attack which you can use. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to weapons, there is one there is one thing I find um, in- interesting w- interesting with it. Um, yeah. The f- so, two th- two things two, two things to note. One of them is when it comes to calculating the da- the damage. Um, yeah. You have it. You have it based on an attribute, but also has a modifier. But there's in addition to that a um st- a static, not not necessarily static. A um a number in parentheses. What is that? Is that meant to be like yeah. the cap? No, exactly. Yeah, this is a bit uh, poorly explained here. I I I, am, I uh, admit. So um, weapons damage are based on on an attribute, mm-hmm. uh, like in most cases, like a heavy weapon is based on strength and or agility if it's a fast weapon or dexterity if it's a really finesse weapon. And then you have another, uh, as you said, a flat or a static bonus here. So we don't roll. I, I, I took the approach of not rolling for damage. Uh, so we already rolled to hit. Uh, it's very unsatisfying when you say you roll 19 on your die, and then you're going to roll uh, the damage, and you roll a 1 on your d12. So it's very... The player gets excited, and then they get sad. And I didn't want that, so I used flat numbers instead. So we take the Great Dax, for instance. So the Great Dax is strength plus 7. So that's your damage. If you have 4 strength, you do 11 damage with your Great Dax every time you hit. And if you crit, you do the other value within the parentheses as well. So that is the crit value, the, the number within the parentheses. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, great access has plus 10 damage when you do a critical hit, which is, which is the highest on, of the weapons. Um, this, gives, uh, this gives a lot of uh, opportunities to me as a designer to make sure weapons feel very different since the critical value is not connected to the die roll that you do for instance in D&D with a weapon. Mm-hmm. Here it's a, uh, an attribute plus something. So some weapons could potentially be super good at normal attacks but really bad when they do critical hits or vice versa. So you could... Uh, switch it up a lot and what weapon you choose could matter. So it's another, just another aspect for me as a designer to uh, split up weapon and make them more interesting uh, for different builds. Yeah, and the other thing that I wanted to point, point out is the proficiency skill. 
that e yeah. that each of the weapon each of the weapons have. Yeah. So that is not um, explained here. Proficiency skill is something that you, as you level up, mm -hmm. you uh, so you don't have. Um, in D, um, I'm, I, I do a lot of D and D references, and it's just because uh, a lot of people know D and D. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep doing this. In D and D, for instance, you uh, can either you have a hard cap on weapon. Basically, you either can use it or you can't use it because if you if you're not proficient within the weapon type, you have disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Which is basically hard. No, you cannot use it. Uh, it's almost the same. So I, I, I did another approach where you uh, um, weapons are based on your uh, weapon skill, how good you handle them, but also you can spec additional weapon points as you level up into certain aspects, into certain weapons to train them. So, for instance, um, and this goes from zero to three, and you're fully trained in a weapon when it's up to three, and that is influence your accuracy. So mm -hmm. we say I have an, an uh, a mace, uh, or, or wait, we continue with the great axe. So I have a great axe, and I gain from my strength, I gain two in accuracy. So when I hit, I, I add two to my die. But then I level up and I uh, select another weapon point, and I select it into great axe because I used that during this level. So now I have plus one additional from that point. So, and when I reach maximum weapon skill which is uh three uh in any weapon so my, when my great dax has three weapon skill i can use the proficiency skill i gain access to this mm -hmm. so within this uh, preview guide you could never reach that point because you need to be i think at level four level five is the first point where any class can actually reach a proficiency skill with their weapon points uh, so I don't think I wrote them out anywhere here. No, I should not have. So that is the proficiency skill. So you gain access to it as you level up, if you practice with that weapon, basically. And this also gives the incentive to people to actually uh, try different type of weapons, because when you switch from the Great Axe to, we say, a, a, a longsword, you're not terribly bad at a longsword because it's also based on your strength. But you haven't practiced it, so you could get a little bit better, but you're not terribly bad because you're not hard-capped in... I cannot use it because I will have disadvantage, and now I need to select a new feat or talent to actually use the longsword. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, the idea there. And that is the proficiency skill. So when you have trained your weapon to a maximum that type, you gain the proficiency skill. Now, with I do appreciate that because I think I think the idea of weapon skills is an, is an underrated an underrated concept in some cases and um a con and a case of swinging the pendulum too far the other the other way in other cases like say Shadowrun where everything everything has to have a skill and sub skills and just way too much of it but I digress mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. When it comes to armor, since we're not doing the def we're not doing the defense bonus with how you've designed defense, um, yeah, what what does uh, what does armor contribute in Demon Ascendant? Yeah, so armor um, has been uh, during the process of making armor has been basically everything, uh, but I didn't want AC. Uh, that was for sure. I wanted evasion. So armor had to bring something to the table, and it had to be scalable. So uh, there is multiple ways to do armor. Like if you look at video games, you do uh, armor is basically either a percentage base. You pull like oh, you deal. Uh, it's easy with computers, right? Because you can do mm -hmm. percentage. Like, but you cannot do that in tabletop RPGs. So you do flat numbers. Like oh, it's a it's a, a number you just pull off, basically. Oh, it's, oh, I have this big armor. Every attack does three damage less to me. Also gets really imbalanced super quickly depending on what you're facing. Like, oh, I have this big, chunky armor, so I'm supposed to be resistance, but as soon as I face someone who does enough damage, it basically didn't matter between you and me what armor we had, because both of us, I took 22 damage and you took 25, even though I had a super cool armor. And if the value would be too high, I would basically be undamaged by small attacks. No one could, like, if my 
reduction value would be 10, for instance, we say, I'm just pulling numbers here, but uh, then any attack below 10 would not be able to damage me at all. Or like, so it's really, it's really tricky how you do those things. And you, my system didn't really support that. So I decided that uh, armor is basically another value of health that's on top of your health because that's scalable. So when you uh, put on your armor, you put on you have five uh, armor pieces basically, mm -hmm. so with armor slots, and they make up for uh, all of them have a certain amount of armor points. And as soon as combat starts, all those armor points are transitioned into health and put on uh, your health basically. So if you have the plate mail, you gain another like 30 armor. But if you have leather gear, you gain 10 or like five additional uh, health at the start of the combat. Mm -hmm. So it's really simplistic how it's done. And then uh, within the combat itself, you don't differentiate them. Armor, you cannot like, oh, I want to attack his armor or pass his armor. It's just like it's health. So it's yeah. another all health points, no matter what game you play or wounds or whatever, is always very... Not subjective, that's the word I'm looking for. It's very uh, abstract, that's the word I'm looking mm -hmm. for, anyway. Like, uh, it's it's always going to be abstract. So this is another way of abstracting it, I guess. So it's uh, armor is health. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So yeah. you put on more health. And uh, the only issue and the tricky things are when you uh, do things like, oh, I'm going to take off this armor, I'm going to heal, and I'm going to put it on. What happens to my health? Uh, so there's a little bit, and there's some rules there. I uh, didn't explain it here, but uh, that's the only, like, otherwise it's uh, super clean. Yeah. Now, that be, now with that in mind, uh, when it comes to, when, one of the other things that I couldn't help but notice is the, is that not only can you get powers through, uh, through, through ability, through abilities points, through, um, through, your class and your class and your bloodline, but those points, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, can also be spent on talents. Uh, you cannot spend them on talents, but you gain a talent mm -hmm. points. You gain one talent point to level yep. one, so you cannot spend ability points on talents. Ah. But you gain, you may select a talent at level one, five, and eight. I think mm -hmm. it is, or one, five, and eleven. Yeah, so ah. you gain to select a talent, and I've I've added a few of them here within mm -hmm. the this one yeah yeah now one of the with that with that in with that in mind um i think one of the other things i do want to cover is the is the concept of demonic surge yeah because yeah obviously the whole having demonic blood can have some advantages but also carry some risks if somebody wants to make that gambit exactly so um uh... So the idea here is that um, the game is called Demon Ascendance, right? And you're going to be fighting mostly demons. Like eventually you're going to be traveling to demonic realms, fighting demons and doing uh, that kind of shit. And as you do, um, and as you do continue, like fight and things, you, you have this demonic blood inside you and you can um, influence it a little bit and like and surge it to actually... Uh, uh, provide you additional uh, uh, like when you cannot make something like on, when you're on the edge and of succeeding something you can perform a demonic surge this is basically when you uh, when you roll a die and you don't exceed the number instead you match the number so when you match the number you have a choice do I want to do a demonic surge if I do I will succeed but that's the risk of demonic mutations and demonic mutations are both good and bad. They provide uh, uh, good things as well, like additional power, like night vision. But they also provide uh, um, some physical aspects, which could be bad. And they influence uh, how you interact with this world. Because you get every time you get a mutation, you get more demon-like as your ancestry. And uh, this provides you with additional points into your demonic influence skill and demonic influence can be used when you're negotiating you can negotiate with demons if you have high demonic influence they don't want to kill you anymore because they see you as one of them eventually and you uh, can do all these cool manipulation things but it also complicates things because if you have high demonic uh, inf influence 
that also means that a lot of creatures in your world would uh, uh, see this as uh, like they might be disgusted or horrified on how you look and uh, maybe not trust you because you have spikes out of your back your eyes are uh, mm -hmm. like you know and uh, uh so it complicates your other relations within the world, within the mortal world, and with other ones who see this as corrupt power. Mm -hmm. um, so that is basically the demonic part. So as you start out, you're not as demonic at all, but if you continue and take that route, because the mutations, even though they give you some negative things, the positive things is, uh, is pretty strong. So you will get stronger if you have them, but you will be more demon-like and it will get tougher uh, on social interactions with your own kind, basically. Mm -hmm. But you could uh, uh, negotiate and socially interact with demons and they might uh, actually agree to you or like you could deceive them or persuade them and things like this. Mm -hmm. That's a, It's a cool aspect of the game, which will get more... Uh, um, a bigger role as you uh, as you play, basically. Mm -hmm. And I'm with that now. With that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count for the book for the full book? Oh, uh, it's actually going to be just above three hundred pages. Uh, I, I I did the calculation a lot of times and. Uh, uh, so that's but it's going to be roughly just above 300 pages, depending on like uh, on on the Kickstarter and if we get some additional things in there. Uh, but at least 300 pages. So like, and uh, uh, there will be a lot of content in mm -hmm. there. Well, you said you said that you're covering from levels first to 15, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and in this case, I, I don't even write any lore about them or anything. I just go full on on the combat aspects because that's what the preview guide is, basically. Mm -hmm. So in here, like, we don't do uh, much, really. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, continue. <laughs> oh, now... Level 1 to 15, you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, obvious, obviously, this is something you've been designing for quite a while. And... yeah. What what would you say were some what would you say were some of the lessons you en you ended up learning through experience, um in de in designing the game. Ooh, experience lessons, tough one. Um, I guess, I guess, one of the things is like basically you're never finished, like iterating on something and iterating again is the thing like uh this is basically version eight of the game uh and and every version is a big like uh, like change and uh um a lot of like that was my first thing in the start i didn't want to borrow as well like and and i learned that borrow is probably the best thing to do you borrow it and you put your own twist on it Mm -hmm. uh, so you should, shouldn't be afraid to borrow and uh, and iterate a lot on things like write it down and actually write it. Don't just have it in your head because then you're not iterating. Like write it down. You don't have to play test it even. Sometimes you could just write it down and then uh, uh, sometime later you come back to it and you look at it again and then you write another version of it. And as you do this, you uh, get a lot lot better at actually designing what you want. And this is like. I don't mean like a specific spell here. I mean like broad mechanics or like how you want this thing to feel or like the bloodline, like something like this, or like the class or how this system would work. Um, so I guess that is my learnings. Mm -hmm. And it, I will definitely look forward to seeing how th how this project um, how this project develops and ref and refines. But thank you. with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the crazy that happens around here. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, it was a blast. Like, you're just talking about the game. I can talk. I could probably talk for hours. Uh, so I hope uh, everyone who's listening in uh, gets uh, 
an idea of what Demon Ascendance is mm -hmm. and uh, the, the feeling I'm going for with yeah. the whole thing. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for Demon Ascendant or some or some other project, the door is always open. As I awesome. often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I will definitely do that. Uh, nice talking to you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>